Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. Today, we're going to be going to the beach, enjoying the nice sand, and hopefully taking a dip in the water. These viewers, however, sent in stories of times where their trip to the beach didn't go as planned. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit yours at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. Now, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe if you're new, and get ready for these creepy and downright strange horror stories from the beach. Hey swamp folk, here on our show you know that we love talking about things that help our lives be better, and something that's helped my life be better is getting better sleep, and that's why I really love the folks over at Ghostbed. As a family owned company with over 20 years of experience, Ghostbed knows a thing or two about crafting the perfect mattress. They use only the most durable, supportive, and long lasting materials so you can trust that your bed will provide you with years of excellent sleep. What sets Ghostbed apart is their signature and patented cooling technology. Say goodbye to those restless, sweaty nights. Every mattress keeps you cool, calm, and collected, so you can dream and feel great in the morning. When you purchase a Ghostbed mattress, your comfort is guaranteed. With their 101 night sleep trial, you can try it out, risk free, and experience the difference for yourself. Plus, they offer free shipping, and most items ship within 24 hours. So, what are you waiting for, Swamp Folk? Join me and many others in the swamp today. Visit ghostbed.com slash swamped to save 50% off site-wide. Again, visit ghostbed.com slash swamped to save 50% off site-wide. Strange Experience on a Remote Beach by Walden S. In 2016, I was camping in my troopie, which if you don't know because you're not from Australia, is basically a jeep. I was around the Daintree area. On the night of my 21st birthday, my partner and I decided to go to the beach, Thornton Beach, and smoke a joint, which I have realized was probably pretty dumb because of the crocodiles. It's a fairly remote beach, backing onto a rainforest with a few buildings down the southern end. We're just sitting there, setting up our stuff by the tree line in the shadows, and just enjoying the moonlight and chatting, having a smoke when we hear two twigs break and leaves start to crunch. We both spring around and look behind us, walking backwards towards the beach. When we don't see anything, we assume it was just an animal or a bird, and we walk a few meters down the coast to carry on the night. Maybe 10-15 seconds later after we sat down, a man walked out of the rainforest from where we were previously sitting and made a beeline for the water. We weren't expecting to see another person, so we shuffled back up the beach to the safety of the shadows. The man removed his shirt and started rolling around in the water shallows. It was pretty strange, but you know, to each their own, I guess. He does this for about five minutes before he gets up, stands in the water, faces the ocean for probably another five minutes, then turns around. He's looking in our direction and takes a few steps forward. He bends down, picks up what I assume is a coconut, which causes my partner to stiffen up a little bit. He stood there with the coconut, staring at us for quite some time. We're unsure of what to actually do here. We were pretty positive he couldn't see us in the shadows, but we're starting to doubt it. I could sense my partner beginning to gear up. He'd felt around for a big stick behind him and whispered that if he came too close to us, get ready to run. After another three to five minutes, the man drops the coconut and returns to the beach. We start rising, and my partner grabs the stick, but the man walks past us back into the rainforest. We booked it, back down to the beach, to the car where we were parked, and got the heck out of there. We got all the way back to our freaking campsite in like record time, honestly, feeling pretty damn rattled. We've concluded that maybe he was on ecstasy, or maybe overheating or dehydrated, so perhaps that's why he was rolling around in the water. We honestly don't know, but I don't really want to know. Glowing Orbs at Camp Hero by Anonymous I've just stumbled upon this show, and thoroughly enjoy a lot of the experiences and stories others have shared on it. I finally felt compelled to share an experience of my own. And while it may not be as provoking or profound as some of the stories told on this show, it honestly still fills me with strange and mysterious feelings 
all these years later. I grew up on Long Island in the state of New York. My older sister, her boyfriend, and I often walked the trails and the beaches at night. One evening, we were walking at Camp Hero State Park. It was a full moon, so it was very bright out. As we were walking the trail, we stopped to relax and looked over the water. My sister's boyfriend sparked up a joint and we all were partaking and relaxing. While gazing out onto the open water, we spotted a small light in the distance. My sister inquired what we thought it might be. Her boyfriend said it was probably just a light on a distant boat. I agreed, but we didn't know much about it. However, as the moments passed, we noticed the light approaching us, getting closer by the minute. As it moved closer, it appeared to be above the water, in the sky, not on the water floating. We soon realized it was not light on a distant boat. We continued speculating about what it could be, and I concluded that it had to be someone's small drone. But as the light came closer and closer, the brightness got stronger and more intense. If you know Camp Hero, you know that there are cliff edges that hang over the water. We were standing on the edge with this orb approaching us. Within five minutes, the orb was no longer in the distance. It was hanging in front of us. It was not over the water, but somewhat over the sandy beach. We just stood there, staring at it in awe. It had a whitish purple glow. Despite being nighttime, it was bright out due to the light of the full moon. On this high visibility evening, it became evident that there was no drone. This light was standing with no machinery attached, and it just hung about 10 feet in front of us for about 30 seconds. It then disappeared so that it almost seemed to envelop itself. We all decided to get the hell out of there, and that was it. This was back sometime in 2015. I've visited the park numerous times since then, and I've never seen anything remotely close to it. Maybe we were all just a bunch of stone teenagers and it was a group delusion or something. But uh, I've done my fair share of weed and that's never happened. That night will stick with me forever. The park itself is shrouded in mystery, and I can only speculate that the orb was a remnant of one of those experiments conducted at Camp Hero back in the day. Creepy Brighton Beach Story by Anonymous so we're going to have to go back to the early 90s for this one. When I lived out in Brooklyn, in 1992, I moved out from rural Ohio to the Big Apple to pursue my dreams of being an artist. It was one of the scariest things I've ever done, but I have few regrets in life. Living in New York City was one of the happiest, most exciting times. Although I had little money, I had many friends and good stories because of my time there as well as some not so great stories too. Anyway, I lived in a place in Brooklyn called Brighton Beach. Many of you will be very familiar with the area because, according to my kid anyway, it's a place you start in the video game GTA 4. It's right next to Coney Island and has a bunch of above ground railways over the streets and water. It's actually the same place where the car chase scene takes place in that old French Connection movie. Brighton Beach is more commonly known as Little Odessa or Little Russia because of the large amount of Eastern European immigration here. Russian-speaking people had been flocking here since the 1970s, but after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the level of immigration went through the roof. Nowadays, it's not entirely uncommon to see stores or restaurants in Brighton Beach with Russian characters on them, such as Cyrillic, I believe it's called. And much like any group of people who emigrated to the United States, they brought along their customs, their religions, and most significant to the story, their organized crime. So, I had this buddy when I lived out in Brooklyn, one I often used to hang out with. One day, we were walking past this Russian cafe when a fight spills into the street. These Russian guys are kicking the crap out of these American guys, like really putting the hurt to them. My buddy and I are just watching from across the street, gopping like people usually do whenever there's a street fight. The American guys start running away, and this one Russian guy pulls out something from his shirt. It looked like something that I couldn't tell at first, but then I could tell quickly from the loud noise it produced that it was a gun, and they started shooting after the fleeing American guys. He had ripped off his shirt in the scuffle, and I noticed that he had all these tattoos all over his chest and back. 
pictures of those domes they have in Russian churches, all of these other religious iconography, and he had these two stars on each of his shoulders, like an old style design that reminded me of those directional pointers on maps. We just kept walking before the Russian guys caught us staring, and I thought that would be the end of it. But my buddy was pretty fascinated by the tattoos. In a spur of the moment decision, he got himself a pair of shoulder stars similar to the kind the Russian guy had on them. Admittedly, they did look pretty cool, and I understand why my buddy wanted to show them off during the following summer. But when he did, we found some pretty weird things would happen whenever we were out in public. For example, once we went to this little Pelemony place we always visited, Pelemony are like these little dumpling type things, and I'm probably spelling them and saying them wrong, but they're really cheap and I, and I really like them. They're super filling, and uh, they made up a big chunk of our diet back in the day, especially when I lived in Brooklyn. Anyway, we eat a bunch of dumplings, we drink a few shots of cheap vodka, and then go to pay the check. The service had been extra good that day and we intended to tip them what little we could. But the owners wouldn't take our money, no matter how much we insisted. The guy behind the counter just laughed nervously and kept pushing our hands away while talking to my buddy with the tattoos in Russian. Now we were definitely broke enough not to refuse a free meal, so we just kind of went on our way and didn't really overthink it. But as the weeks went by, stuff like that kept happening. People would randomly speak Russian to my buddy and act skittish around him. While we didn't know why, I remember having a hunch that maybe it had something to do with those tattoos. A hunch that was confirmed with one of the rushing speaking incidents turned pretty nasty. This big bear of a guy walks up to my buddy and greets him warmly in Russian. My buddy says, sorry, I don't speak Ruski. The dude's expression changes entirely. He starts poking my buddy real hard where his tattoos are, speaking angrily in Russian the whole time. Whoever was with him only barely restrained him from kicking my buddy's butt, and we were left confused and frightened. After that, my buddy didn't show off his tattoos so much anymore. He didn't have them on for much longer, honestly. Not because he had them removed, but the whole tattoo removal expensive back then was just like not what it is today. He didn't have them much longer because he got a knock on his apartment door one day. He answered and these big guys in tracksuits burst through the door, grabbing him and forcing his shirt off. Then with the help of hot clothes irons, they burned and cut those things off of his shoulders. There was nothing but raw flesh left. I remember going to visit him in the hospital, and he told me the gist of what happened. There weren't too many details. I just put that together myself. It was the most horrifying thing I think I had ever heard, and as you can imagine, my buddy was traumatized. His parents had to pay his hospital bills, and he moved back to Vermont to live with them. After that, I stayed well away from the Russian cafes, and stayed away from any large Russian man in a tracksuit. Honestly, I didn't really know there was Russian Mafia on the Brighton Beach area, and I don't know if they're still there today, but be careful out there, and don't get tattoos just because you think they're cool. Definitely know what they mean. Man Found Dead on the Beach by SD News in a heart-wrenching incident that has shocked the local community, a Houston man lost his life after being trapped beneath his pickup truck on Crystal Beach. The Galveston County Sheriff's Department reported that the unfortunate victim, John Raymond Wilson, who was 37 years old of the 2000 block of Fenwick, Houston, succumbed to his tragic accident after the truck settled into the sand, immobilizing him. John Raymond Wilson had been enjoying an evening of surf fishing near Voigt on Monday night. Surf fishing, a popular recreational activity, often draws enthusiasts to the tranquil and scenic beaches along the Gulf of Mexico. According to Lt. Tommy Hansen of the Galveston County Sheriff's Department, it is believed that Wilson might have been fishing before deciding to rest under his truck for some reason. It appears he may have been fishing, that he got under the truck to lay down, and it sank and got on top of him and he couldn't get out, Lt. Hanson explained. This incident underscores the unforeseen dangers that can arise from seemingly innocuous actions, especially in dynamic environments like sandy beaches. Witnesses at the scene noted that Wilson arrived at the beach around 9pm on Monday evening which was approximately 90 minutes before the scheduled low tide under a full moon, as reported by the National Weather Service. The full moon, 
while providing a serene and illuminated night, also brings out higher and lower tides due to its gravitational pull. This may have contributed to the truck's instability and subsequent settling into the soft sand. The critical discovery was made early Tuesday morning when the truck was spotted in the surf following the high tide. The high tide likely exacerbated the situation, submerging the vehicle partially and making it more conspicuous to passerbys. Concerned citizens who saw the truck in the surf promptly reported it, leading to the dispatch of a tow truck to the location. The tow truck driver arriving with the intent to pull the vehicle from the surf encountered an unexpected and grim reality. They discovered before they could even move the vehicle a foot or so there was a body under it, Lieutenant Hansen recounted. This revelation transformed what seemed like a routine vehicle recovery into a tragic scene confirming the fatal outcome of the accident. The Galveston County Sheriff Department, while investigating the incident, found no immediate evidence suggesting foul play. There is nothing to indicate foul play, Hansen emphasized, pointing towards a tragic accident rather than a criminal act. To ascertain the exact cause of death, an autopsy has been scheduled. The autopsy will provide detailed insights into the circumstances surrounding Wilson's death including whether he sustained any injuries while trying to free himself or if the factors contributed to his demise. This tragic event has sent ripples of sorrow through both the local and wider community. Surf fishing and beach outings, typically associated with relaxation and enjoyment, now carry a little bit of a somber reminder of nature's unpredictable dangers. It serves as a poignant reminder for beachgoers to exercise caution and be aware of their surroundings especially when interacting with heavy machinery or vehicles in variable terrains. In memory of John Raymond Wilson, the community reflects on the need for increased awareness and safety measures to prevent such unfortunate incidents in the future. His untimely death serves as a sobering lesson about the delicate balance between enjoying nature's beauty and respecting its potential hazards. John's passing is a profound loss, felt deeply by those who knew him and by the broader community. As investigations continue and the autopsy results are awaited, the focus remains on understanding how such a tragedy could have occurred and on ensuring that similar incidents are prevented in the future. The Galveston County Sheriff's Department and the local community stand united in their grief to resolve and honor Wilson's memory through increased vigilance, safety awareness, and much more on Crystal Beach and beyond. The Missing People of Piha Beach It was a sunny Saturday morning when the Wilson family arrived at Piha Beach. The family had been planning this trip for weeks, excited to spend the weekend enjoying the stunning black sand and the invigorating surf that the beach was famous for. Piha Beach, located on the western coast of New Zealand's North Island, was a favorite spot for locals and tourists alike. Known for its dramatic scenery, including the iconic Lion Rock, it was a place of natural beauty and adventure. Mike and Sarah Wilson, along with their two children, Lily and Max, decided that they would find a nice spot near the lifeguard tower. They weren't alone. Piha Beach was bustling with activity. Families played in the sand, surfers tackled the waves, and hikers explored the surrounding trails. By noon, the beach was usually at its busiest, and this day was no different. The lifeguards were vigilant, their eyes scanning the water for any sign of trouble. The day seemed perfect, a testament to the simple joys of life. But as the afternoon sun began to dip towards the horizon, the atmosphere would soon shift into unsettling directions. It started with a scream. At first, it was faint, almost blending in with the sounds of the ocean and laughter itself. But it grew louder, more desperate. Sarah looked up from her book and saw a woman frantically waving her arms pointing towards the water. A crowd began to gather at the shoreline and the lifeguards sprang into action. Someone had gone missing in the surf. Mike grabbed Max and pulled him close while Sarah held tightly onto Lily. They watched as the lifeguards swam out, their red and yellow uniforms stark against the deep blue water. Minutes felt like hours as the search continued. Eventually, the lifeguards returned, empty-handed and exhausted. Whispers spread through the crowd, 
someone had disappeared without a trace. The missing person was identified as Tom Hensley, a local who was known for his strong swimming abilities. His friends were in shock. It was as if he had been swallowed by the ocean. The news of Tom Hensley's disappearance spread quickly, casting a pall over the once lively beach. The Wilsons decided to stay the night at a nearby lodge, hoping the incident was an isolated one. That evening, they joined other concerned beachgoers at a local community center where a meeting had been called. Detective Emma Carter, a seasoned investigator from Auckland, addressed the worried crowd. We are doing everything we can to find Tom, she assured. However, the ocean is unpredictable and rescues can be challenging. Despite her words, the unease was palpable. This wasn't the first time someone had gone missing at Pia Beach, but it was the first time in some years. The community was tight-knit, and each loss was deeply felt. The following day, the Wilson family debated whether they should stay or leave. Ultimately, curiosity and a sense of solidarity kept them at Pia. The beach was noticeably quieter, with many opting to stay away. Those who did visit were, were cautious, keeping a close eye on the waves. A week or so passed, and then another disappearance occurred. This time, though, it was a tourist from Germany, a young woman named Anna Mueller. She had been hiking along the cliffs when she just vanished. Her friends reported seeing her one moment and then finding no trace of her. Detective Carter returned to Piha, her demeanor more serious. Two disappearances in such a short span was alarming. She began to dig deeper, looking into old records and interviewing longtime residents of the area. One evening, as the sun set over the horizon, casting a golden glow over the beach, Detective Carter made a discovery. There had been a similar pattern of disappearances decades ago. In the 1970s, the cases were never solved, and the files were incredibly thin. But the circumstances were seriously scary. They were almost the exact same details that's happening right now. People vanishing without a trace near or on Piha Beach. Rumors began to surface about an old Maori legend associated with Piha Beach. According to the legend, the beach was guarded by a Tanawa, a supernatural creature that resided in the waters and cliffs. Now this creature was said to be the protector, but it was also a punisher, taking those who disrespected the land or the sea. Now forgive me, I'm probably going to say this name terribly wrong. Elder Hemi Rangi, a respected Maori leader, was invited to speak to the community at large. He recounted the legend, emphasizing the need to respect the natural world. The Tanawa is a guardian, but it also is a reminder of the balance we must maintain, he explained. Disrespect the land and you disrupt the harmony. While many dismissed the legend as just mere folklore, others couldn't quite ignore the pattern. The idea of a supernatural explanation, though unsettling, began to take root. Driven by the need to find answers, Detective Carter enlisted the help of marine biologists and geologists. They explored the possibility of underwater currents and hidden caves that could explain these disappearances. Divers searched the ocean floor and drones were sent to scan the cliffs and the dense forest. One evening, Carter sat with Mike and Sarah Wilson, who had become deeply involved in the search efforts. There's just something we're missing, she mused. Something that ties all of this together. Sarah, who had been reading the history of Piha, suggested looking into the land's past ownership. Maybe there's a clue who lived here before that we're missing, she offered. Their investigation led them to a man named Walter Hensley, Tom Hensley's great-grandfather. Walter had been a prominent figure in Piha's early days, known for his extensive knowledge of the land and sea. His journals preserved by the family contained detailed accounts of the area, including references to strange occurrences and warnings about the beach. In Walter Hensley's journals, Carter found a passage that stood out. It described a series of rituals performed by early settlers to appease the spirits of the land. These rituals, conducted in conjunction with the local Maori, were meant to ensure safe passage and harmony with the natural world. Over time, these practices have been forgotten, 
Carter, along with Elder Rangi and the community, decided to revive the old rituals in hopes of restoring balance. A ceremony was planned involving both traditional Maori practices and elements from Walter Hensley's journals. On the day of the ceremony, the community gathered at Piha Beach. El Durangi led the ritual, invoking the spirit of the Tanawa and asking for his protection. Offerings were made and prayers were spoken. Days turned into weeks and the beach slowly returned to its normal rhythm. The disappearances ceased altogether and the sense of unease began to lift. The community remained vigilant but hopeful. One evening, as the Wilson family walked along the shore, they noticed something in the distance. It was a figure stumbling out of the water. As they rushed over, they recognized him. It was Tom Hensley, disoriented but alive. Tom's return was nothing short of a miracle, but his memory of the time he was missing was incredibly hazy. He spoke of strange dreams, an overwhelming sense of peace, as if he had been in another world despite his ordeal. He was entirely unharmed and looked like he had been fine, to be honest. The mystery of Piha Beach remains unsolved. While the community believes that the rituals and respect for the land played a big part in the ending of the disappearances, the true nature of what happened to those who vanished is still honestly unknown. Piha Beach continues to be a place of beauty and wonder but also a reminder of the delicate balance between humanity and the natural world. The legend of the Tanawa lives on, a guardian of the land and a symbol of the mysteries that lie beneath the surface of our understanding. The Wilson family returned to their daily lives forever changed by their experience. They carried with them a deeper respect for the world around them and the stories that shape our connection to it. And as they looked out at the horizon, they knew that some mysteries were meant to remain a testament to the unseen forces that weave through our lives. Thanks for listening to these creepy and downright strange horror stories from the beach. If you enjoyed these stories, please do me a big favor and be sure to give this video a like. The more likes it gets, the more YouTube promotes it and that helps us grow the swamp. If you're new here, why not join us? Be sure to slap that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss any new episodes. I upload multiple episodes every single week and all things natural and supernatural. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp, as stories like yours will help keep this show going on a daily basis. If you're on the go, but you don't have YouTube Premium, but you would like to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and literally everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. I would love to know in the comments down below what story tonight was your favorite. I would have to personally say those last two missing people's cases, or I guess... One of them wasn't a missing person's case, but those last two cases definitely kind of had me at the edge of my seat. There's just something about those crime and just more strange nature cases in general that just really get me interested. Thank you guys so much for supporting the swamp the way you do. Don't forget to join me over on X, Instagram, Facebook, and all those good social medias, and I'll see you soon with another creepy episode.